this is attachment based telehealth play therapy. So we're going to talk about learning about our attachment styles how they impact how therapists provide diagnosis, how they impact how uh, clients receive treatment and engage in treatment. We're gonna talk about barriers associated with telehealth and methods to overcome those barriers. And then the third one is to identify three, or five, three to five attachment-based interventions for telehealth. Um, interventions are really specific to therapists. We use them as part of our treatment, but it's also something that's really great to teach to parents, especially um, we have been really fortunate here to work with Heart of Iowa, which is a facility that helps um, addictions, particularly mothers and addictions, and it allows their children to be with them. And so we provide some of these skills to those mothers so that they can continue to have a good connection and, and foster their attachment with their children, even if they're separated due to treatment. So some of this is gonna seem a little bit technical, but know that you can use it at any point in your life. Uh, training schedule, the first hour is really gonna be talking about attachment styles and history. The second hour is gonna be talking about telehealth, the benefits and barriers to it. Um, here in Iowa, telehealth is a really important aspect of counseling that we talk about often. Um, there's just so many small communities out there and not enough therapists to go out to all of them. And there are some wonderful therapists out in the community that just aren't trained to work with children or to work with attachment issues in general, and they don't feel comfortable doing that. And so telehealth is a way that we can get more people access to trained therapists. It's also a way that like, if you're separated for any reason, whether you're in jail, whether you're uh, in treatment, whether you've just needed to leave a house for a long period of time, it's a way the parents and kids can continue to connect beyond being able to be face-to-face. -face. So in, in the post-COVID world, it's become a really, really big part of our life. And then the last one is some interventions and practice. I'll briefly show you some fun websites that are out there and things that you can play with um, when with kids and, and you can practice it with your kids. I do it with my kids um, and they're just great ways of interacting and being able to continue that attachment over the internet. So we're going to talk about attachment theory. Attachment theory was developed by John Bowlby. And it was to try and explain why children became so distressed when they were separated from their primary attachment figure. And I'm gonna try my best to say primary attachment figure, but most of the time and most of the studies were done with mothers. That doesn't mean that mothers can be the only primary attachment figure. We know that foster parents, fathers, extended family, as long as there is an attachment figure, they can become the primary attachment figure provided they are meeting the child's emotional and, and social needs as well as their uh, biological needs. Um, but you will see mother used a lot here. We're gonna to use the word mother because it's just where most of the studying went to and it's still the standard for what they consider the primary attachment figure. Um, prior to John Bowlby, uh, a lot of people in our field were theorizing that the crying and the, the distress that children showed when they were separated from their mothers was because they uh, were trying to protect themselves. It was a, an immature defense mechanism. And what Bowlby found out is that being close to a primary attachment figure, a adult who is with you constantly and is able to support you increases your chance of survival. And that actually it's not an immature defense system. It's a way of evolution trying to make sure that children and, and children and parents stay together. So that children are not left alone or constantly rotating through other family members. Um, he, when he did his testing, uh, his hypothesis was that there was about 60% of the population that have what we call secure attachments. About 20% of the population has anxious resistant attachments and about 20% has what they call anxious or uh, avoidant resistant attachments. And we'll go through and talk a little bit more about the, each of those in a bit here. Um, and there was also a fourth one that was added on, which is disorganized. And we'll talk some about that too. Um, after Bowlby came Mary Ainsworth. She's a pretty big 
person here in our play therapy world. She developed the empirical study, the way to uh, constantly be able to test and, and gather quantitative information. And that was called the strange situation. And the strange situation is a study where um, a child and a mother are in a room, they play a little bit, um, they have a bit of bonding, it's about three minutes of bonding time. And then a stranger comes into the room and the therapist or the, uh, the scientist will monitor what happens between the child and that stranger. And then the mother will leave the room and the child will be left alone with the stranger. And it's testing to see how the child's reacting. In a situation where we have a secure attachment, the child often is not comforted by the stranger. The child becomes very distressed when the mother leaves and the child becomes comforted when the mother returns. Um, in an anxious attachment, you might see uh, situations where the child is anxious before the mother leaves. The child is very difficult to console when the child returns. Um, the child is not, uh, able to like console themselves at all without the mother. And then avoidant, you'll see the child will um, kind of turn away from the mother when the mother returns. So it's not comforted by the mother returning. Uh, they may uh, ignore them, look away, um, walk, turn their backs toward them. Um, they may even hit. These are the situations we see with the avoidant resistant children. And we're going to see a couple of examples of this um, as we go forward. Um, Mary Ainsworth's work found that parent-infant interactions in the first year were important. In fact, they're the most important. Uh, the first 18 months of life is essential to any child. And this is, essential, this is very important um, as therapists because it's very rare that I ever see a child under 18 months. I usually see children three years and above. And so by that time, this, this stage has already passed. This primary uh, interaction stage has passed and the attachment style has been created for this child. What we know is if we can help parents uh, increase their attachment during these first couple of months of the child's life, these first 18 months of the child's life, they have better chances for success. Um, they have better chances of uh, not developing any uh, mental illnesses. They have better uh, coping strategies. They're able to deal with stress. And then the, the parent attachment bond is a lot better. There was a second study done called the still face experiment, which you guys are going to get to watch. And it really um, shows and explains how quickly the attachment between a child and a caregiver can be disrupted. And when we say disrupted attachment, um, we're not talking about one big event. Um, we're not even talking about a couple little events. It, it is normal for there to be some disruption between parents and children. Um, I don't know how many of you guys have children out there, but you'll know that you might, might not be able to attend to your child every single cry. <laughs> you know, there's gonna be moments when there's just something else that you're doing that is equally as important and you can't stop what you're doing to go and help that child. That's okay. That is not the basis of attachment disorder uh, or the attachment issue or injury. The issue is if it's continually happening and that child starts to have more negative experiences than positive experiences. In the video that we're gonna show, the doctor is going to talk about um, what they call the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good being everything that we see when a child is really well attached to their parent. The bad being that break when we see them separated but it can go back to good. And then the ugly being is when we don't have that chance to re reattach and the, the injury becomes repetitive. So going back to those four types of attachment, like I said, originally there were three, the fourth one was added later. Secure attachment, the children will use the caregiver as a secure base for exploration. It shows, a pro they show appropriate distress when the caregiver leaves and is comforted on return. Um, with secure children, we see kind of an inner working model of uh, the idea that I am loved, I am cared for, I like to be around people. The inner working model is I am some, or I find it relatively easy to get close to others, and I am comfortable depending on them and having them depend on me. 
I don't worry about being abandoned or about someone else getting too close to me. So secure attachment makes it easier for me to get close to others. It makes me feel as though people that get close to me are not going to injure me. They're not going to leave me. I feel safe in my exploration of the world around me. When it comes to ambivalent attachment, um, the child does not use the caregiver as a secure base for exploration. Uh, they protest before the, chair, the caregiver leaves. They are upset about the caregiver leaving and are slow to warm on return. Um, they express concern about the caregiver location. They might look around a lot, ask a lot of where are they, when are they coming back. Um, they'll look out the window. They're very worried about where that person is. Um, and then when the mother or caregiver does return, we see them seeking contact but resisting when uh, it is achieved. So they may be held, but they're not happy about it. They're not calmed by this. Um, they feel fairly uncomfortable when they're reunited with a caregiver. And then for the ambivalent type of attachment, we see um, I find we see an inner working model that says I find it. I find others are reluctant to get as close as I would like. I often worry my partner doesn't really love me or I won't stay with me and I want to get very close and sometimes scare people away. So this is uh, an inner working model that kind of goes throughout their life of like, I'm reluctant to get as close as I would like. I get scared in situations because I'm afraid of uh, loss of attachment. Avoidant attachment is a uh, little emotional sharing and play, few signs of emotion when the caregiver leaves or returns, and show low affection when offered affection. Um, these children will often treat strangers similarly to caregivers. Uh, and then the very last one is disorganized. And this was added a little bit later. Um, so you'll see the Bowlby and Ainsworth didn't have disorganized as part of their original three types. Um, disorganized is characterized by a confused response to a caregiver's return. So they may um, go through some of the different, they might be secure sometimes, they might be ambivalent. Sometimes they may want to be comforted, but they'll like walk backwards into a care situation. Um, they just, they, they don't have a good base. They don't have an inner working model that helps them dictate what they're doing. And then this next one, we're going to watch a video. So this is a very short version of the strange situation. And I will let you guys know uh, because it bothers me. Um, but there is a child that gets very upset in this video. Um, she just starts crying. And I don't know why it bothers me. But I, I've decided I'm going to let you guys know that be prepared for that. They do comfort the child. The child gets comforted in the end. Um, but it's a little bit painful to watch for me. So we are going to watch this together and I'm going to go on silent for a minute because that's how it works when I share videos here. So one second, guys. This experiment, which I watched through a two-way mirror, is designed to gauge how secure is the crucial relationship between mother and child. Okay, this bunny is going to go here and that bunny will be on top. The value of the test has been established in studies that would watch a child one year old and then follow it up and interview them about their relationships to their parents when they were 21 years old. So we're quite confident in the long-term significance of this relationship. After several minutes play, the mother is signaled to leave the room. in the experiment is the child's reaction to her mother's return. The important clue is whether the baby's able to become calmed down by the contact with the mother and get back to play. Sometimes it takes a couple of minutes. You see, when the mother was out, she was only interested in the mother, no interest in the toys. 
Now she has a contact with the mother. She's beginning to show a little interest in the environment. And shortly, she'll be right back with the toys where we started. So you would call this a secure one? Yes, yes. She's certainly much happier. Goes to the door following her. Now, we, we sent the mother right back in. But the point here is not to distress the baby. We're just trying to challenge it. The baby puts her hands to her face in a sad expression. Puts her face down. When she picks her up, she keeps her head down, her arms out. And then she sits in the chair holding the baby. The baby's still sullen. He's, he's low-keyed. So you would call the, this insecure Yes, attachment. insecure. He's avoidant. He's, he's not engaging her, and it's not being, the reunion's not effective. And it's important to remember here that the thing that upset him was her absence. Her, re, her return should be the solution to his problem. Now, this is another pattern that we see in babies who are not good at using their mother as a secure base at home. This baby is also insecure. But you'll see, we got a look at his play before the separation. The mother's left, and when she returns, she picks him up. He can't calm down. He's still upset. She offers a toy to amuse him or to comfort him or to distract him, and he slaps it away. She offers another. He slaps it away. He's angry. He's, he's, we call these babies resistant or ambivalent because they both want her back, and yet can't use the contact. We think that the difficulty is that in the past, when he sought comfort, she's been inconsistent as to whether she's available and responsive or not. Okay. Does anyone have any thoughts on that video? What, what did you think while watching it? I don't, I, I, I'm looking at the name list and I see some names that are, are classically male. And so I don't know how many mothers we have here or how many females versus males. Um, but as a, as a mother and a female watching that video, it's always very difficult because it's hard to not see the person, uh, the, the scientist describing that as being very judgmental to the mother for me. Even, even though as my therapist, my first thought is, you know, oh, she's, she's, he's saying she's damaged the baby because she was inconsistent in her response. I watched that with my three month old. I have him right now because uh, childcare fell through, but it's okay. <laughs> and it definitely, it's hard to watch. I remember watching that in college and it didn't bother me as much as now being a mother. It's, it's a little different. Yeah. It, it's, it's kind of tough to watch those children go through that discomfort and and watch how they get uh, reassured. And it's it's also really hard to understand that different types of attachment are not in themselves a diagnosis. And we'll talk a little bit about diagnosing when it comes to attachment issues. But children just have different types of attachments to their mothers. It does fall pretty consistently, 60, 20, 20. Um, and the primary caregiver is, there's a lot of reasons why attachments might be different. Um, and it's important not to fault the primary caregiver in the case of like, you didn't do the right thing. Um, first off, that doesn't help. Usually, again, we're seeing these children after it's the fact. Mm -hmm. If we see them ahead, we, ahead of the time that they are making the attachment. So during those first 18 months, we always give them suggestions on increasing the attachment if they have that availability. But it's not the primary caregiver as a bad parent if that child doesn't have a secure attachment. There's a lot of other factors that go into it. And when we look at attachment issues and we look at attachment styles, we're using them to better understand this child's inner working model. Um, and even up into adulthood, the adult's inner working model and how they see the world. Um, this is, I don't know why, these are always really tough for me to watch, which is, I've seen them uh, at least a billion times. I think I've watched them. Yeah, at least a billion times, but it can be really tough to watch it and not go to the place of it's a parent's fault if they didn't take care of the child and they don't have a security. Not the case at all. It's a lot of different reasons why we have different attachments.
maybe I saw the video different than you guys because I work with children every day mm -hmm. and I see all different attachments. Sometimes there's a secure attachment and non-secure, but it also depends on who else is in the room. Yeah. So you get so to I, see. I actually didn't agree with the the person that was talking because I actually, you actually have to monitor them not one time of one clip, but multi types to actually see a true attachment understanding. Yeah. So you've seen it where like there have been different reactions on different days, just depending on the environmental factors. Not just that, also the child's mood. Yeah. I mean, it always makes me think of my four-year-old. Um, I'm sure that uh, depending on the day, it would look very different. Um, I saw Georgianne put in the tap, uh, the chat that the still face experiment's also hard to watch. Uh, unfortunately, that's what we're going to be watching next. It is pretty difficult to watch. It's still very short, um, but it's important to know how quickly this disruption can happen and how normal it is for those quick disruptions to happen particularly in the world we live in today. Um, we have a lot of distractions in our life and in caring for our children. We are juggling others, jobs, other children, responsibilities, our own mental health. And then if you have a, a person who's gone through major trauma, they're also dealing with the trauma and the side effects of trauma and any of the, the flashbacks and disassociative symptoms that come with that. It's a lot for any parent to juggle. Um, and so in the still face experiment, we see that quickly we can have a break in our attachment with our parent, um, but it can come back very quickly. And we want to try to have more positive attachments than not. It's really a numbers game. It's, it's not that one time is going to change your attachment style. It's a repeated behavior that will change your attachment style. So let's go to the still face experiment. Babies this young are extremely responsive to the emotions and the reactivity and the social interaction that they get from the world around them. This is something that we started studying oh, 30, 40 years ago when people didn't think that infants could engage in social interaction. In this still face experiment, what the mother did was she sits down and she's playing with her baby who's about a year of age. I need my girl. Oh. And she gives a greeting to the baby. The baby gives a greeting back to her. Yeah. This baby starts pointing at different places in the world and the mother's trying to engage her and play with her. They're working to coordinate their emotions and their intentions. What they want to do in the world and that's really what the baby is used to and then we ask the mother to not respond to the baby the baby very quickly picks up on this and then she uses all of her abilities to try and get the mother back she smiles at the mother she points because she's used to the mother looking where she points. Yeah. The baby puts both hands up in front of her and says, what's happening here? She makes that screechy sound at the mother, like, come on, why aren't we doing this? Even in this two minutes when they don't get the normal reaction, they react with negative emotions, they turn away, they feel the stress of it, they actually may lose control of their posture because of the stress that they're experiencing. Okay. Okay. I'm here. And what are you doing? Oh, yes. Oh, what a big girl. It's a little like the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good is that normal stuff that goes on that we all do with our kids. The bad is when something bad happens, but the infant can overcome it. After all, when you stop the still face, the mother and the baby start to play again. The ugly is when you don't give the child any chance to get back to the good. There's no reparation, and they're stuck in that really ugly situation.
a little bit at the beginning, I talked about why knowing attachment theory is important for ICASA and, and why I think this is important to you guys. And I think it's my, my biggest hope is that it helps you understand um, another layer of the trauma that happens to, to parents and to caregivers. Um, if they're dealing with their own trauma, that trauma gets dispersed to their family members. Um, when I started in the field, my internship was through a uh, mobile crisis with the Phoenix Fire Department. And one of my jobs was to be the first responders to sexual assault victims when they were getting uh, an immediate uh, examination after they'd reported. Um, and a lot of what I did was to work with the kids while the, the parents were in the examination room. And, and the struggles that those parents went through and having to leave their children, even though they've just experienced a lot of trauma, having to leave their children, having to go and try and, and deal with something that's always already very, very difficult, and then having to come back and then take care of those children again. Um, and, and wanting to be the same quality of parent throughout all of that, even though they have had a major event, even though they are already struggling with their own internal feelings. Um, that's where attachment theory, I feel like you guys, it's important for you to know. It's something that you can help with. It's something um, to help empower parents that like, times are tough, let's find somebody that can, that can help take care of kids. Let's find somebody that can be there. And if you can't find somebody, let's find ways that you can have your own time and separate. That still face experiment always makes me think of dissociation, which is a very common symptom for PTSD. Um, when somebody's disassociating, it, it's like they're not in the room with you. And if you have a young child that's seeing that, it, it feels like there's nobody in the room with them. They don't have, they may physically have that adult in there with them, but that person is no longer emotionally available to them at that time. And for a child, again, this is very distressing. They don't have context. They don't understand other parts that are going on. And for that parent, they're not intentionally disassociating. It's just a response to their own trauma. And they're trying to continue to be there in the best way they can. Another one that we talk about with attachment styles is sometimes we see this type of trauma in regards to postpartum depression. With postpartum depression, you will see these long periods where the mother cannot uh, respond to that child and provide that child with what we would consider a secure attachment. Again, not the mother's fault. It's just what's happening on there. And if you're early enough, it's helpful if we can provide um, ways for the mother to enhance the attachment and provide treatment to the mother and make sure the mother is supported. If not, then we work with our attachment style when it comes to therapy and help kids develop a different inner working model than the one that they may have developed during a very troublesome time in their infancy. So attachment answers three questions. Um, our attachment stand answers three questions. It says, am I safe? Am I loved? And can I do things? A child will go through this question hundreds to thousands of times a day. It is the basic part of their exploration. Um, a child will not leave their primary caregiver side if they do not feel safe. Um, they have a hard time attaching to a primary caregiver if they don't feel loved. And if they don't have a primary giver, then caregiver, then they don't feel safe. And if they don't have those two questions answered, then it's very difficult for them to do things. It's difficult for them to feel secure in taking any type of risk, um, whether that be moving away to play with toys, interacting with new people, um, starting school. As we go through our life, it becomes bigger and bigger risks. Um, these three questions help us develop what our internal working model is of how we view the world. Is the world a kind place where I can, where I have people I can trust? Is the world overall quite cruel and there's no one I can trust? You know, these, these are like the internal questions that I'm putting words to and, and the other people have put words to, but they're innate inside of us. And so even young children have them. It's not like they are actively thinking, 
is, is the world kind? And do I have somewhere safe to be? It's something that is being answered by like the animal part of their brain. It, it's just, uh, it's an inherent part of them. Helping to shape our worldview is a lot of our early life, but it can happen as we go on. And therapy's role in helping shape worldview is to help people get down to that inner side, like not the, the thoughts that they're thinking, but the thoughts that they're feeling and help them examine that and be like, how can we change our working model? If you have people you can trust now, how can we help your body go with that to feel that they have people they can trust even if at one point there wasn't and that developed this thought how can we change this thought and this is very difficult because I'm using the word thought a lot and I want to make sure you guys understand that this is not a cognitive thought this is not like a front brain thought like you just go through your day and you're thinking yeah the world's great this is a this is a deep uh, unconscious thought that they have um, and it's a pretty deep feeling um, when we see young, young children with trauma, we know that even, uh, or we know that if they have had trauma before they're able to verbalize, before they've learned language, they will never have the language to explain that trauma. Um, it, it is, it is a feeling at that point. It is not something that they can explain, uh, in a, in words or cognitively. Um, it's not even something they can usually isolate within themselves. It's a very, very deep feeling. Um, and that makes it difficult to treat just because like at a certain point in our life, we become very cognitive. We've become very talking and we'll just talk about it. And I'll just tell myself like everything's okay. And it's hard to talk to something that can't talk back. You can't talk your way out of a feeling in that situation. Um, so let's talk about attachment styles and mental health. Let me ask everybody, just because I, I feel like I've been talking a lot. Can anyone tell me any attachment disorders? So disorders would be things that we can diagnose. There's usually one big one that most people know. Re reattachment disorder? Yep, reactive attachment disorder. RAD, R-A-D. The only other diagnosis than RAD for attachment disorder is called social inhibition disorder. There are two diagnoses for attachment. Again, attachment issues themselves are not mental health issues. You can have insecure attachments, you can have anxious ambivalent attachments and still be well adjusted. You can move on through the world. If you, those types of attachments are a part of who you are and they help you see the world, but it does not necessarily mean that you have a mental health diagnosis or need help. Um, there are only two different, like I said, there's RAD, and social inhibition disorder, and both of those are fairly severe um, in their symptomology to get diagnosed. As therapists, what we don't look for is an attachment disorder. What we look for is attachment, uh, attachment injury history. Um, so times where attachment may have been disrupted in this child's life, times when the child may have started an inner working model um, that doesn't, that was not productive and how can we help address that within the context of dealing with whatever mental health issues they have. So uh, a lot of times we're looking at anxiety. Um, we'll look at a lot of trauma cases, um, particularly with children who've been through foster care and adoption systems. We're looking at trauma in their history and we want to be aware that that attachment component is important. It's a part of who they are and we want to address that while we're also addressing the symptoms of their disorders, if they have one. I, I say of their disorders because uh, I'm a therapist and I, that's kind of what I do. So everyone I see has one. Um, attachment styles uh, are again are the basis, but then how people move on through their life is made up of different components. There's the individuals themselves. Um, that's their ability to emotionally regulate. They might learn other emotional regulation skills or after, uh, after an attachment injury, they might be able to get a better attachment with another secure figure. Um, they might have struggles coping with stress. They might be very good at coping with stress. Um, and they might have struggles with psychological resilience. So um, somebody who lives a fairly, I'm going to use the word neurotypical life, 
uh, where, where they feel as though they're mentally very healthy and everything is going great, may suddenly be hit with some type of trauma that sets them back in a way that they didn't expect. Um, and then what we do know is that some serious attachment injuries can influence whether or not we develop a personality disorder. Um, this is not a direct link. We're still exploring this as, uh, as therapists and as researchers, um, but we do know that, that they play a role. Uh, how you attach with your primary caregiver plays a role in your personality later in life. And, and it might play a role in how uh, you are unable to attach with others. Okay, so let's talk about attachment by age. So I personally see a lot of children, but I actually see adults too. I did kind of have a range of clients and I look for attachment injury in all ages of my clients. Um, when it comes to children, I'm looking for attachment in their patterns of play. When I'm doing an assessment, I'm looking for who's included in their play scenarios. What, uh, what are the primary caregivers in their play scenarios or the caregivers that they might choose? Uh, how do they respond to the other characters? Um, are those characters in tune with the needs of the, their characters? So we've watched a lot of dollhouse play and uh, a lot of other types of play. And we're trying to look to see how they are relating the characters to one another in whatever, whatever they're playing. It's how, they, how they're relating. Um, with teens, uh, we want to see who do they turn to when they need help. Um, are they uh, able to create a secure support system? Um, and a secure support system often includes parents, but we also like to see it include some of their peers. We want them to be able to see and recognize um, untrustworthy people, both in real life and online. Um, and we want to see them making attachments that have healthy elements to them. So we want them to have good boundaries. We want them to be aware of abuse um, and to be aware of manipulation and, and be able to, to recognize when something's unsafe. In adults, uh, attachment is really looking at their intimate and sexual relationships. So how they're able to uh, relate to partners. Um, it also looks at how their friendships, so kind of with teens, adults, again, we're looking at their social network. And, and what we see a lot of adults who've had attachment injuries in their history um, is that they have a very small support network. They may have very, very few friends, or they may have no friends. They may have just the support of family, or they may not even have the support of family. They, are, they have difficulty building a support network around them, and that makes them more susceptible if trauma happens, because they don't have that wide uh, uh, base to lean on. They don't have the people to go to that we want them to have uh, in order to continue to make it through that, to have that resilience. We also look with adults at their self-image and social skills. Uh, Self-esteem is a really big part of attachment. Again, that inner working model is so innate, it becomes part of them. And there are children, er, there are not our children. Part of that model becomes of like, I am not worthy of, of love. So when we went, let me skip back here. So I'm not worthy of being safe. I'm not worthy of being loved can become part of that inner working model. And we'll see very low self-esteem. Um, and self-confidence. And then um, we see trauma happen to, to people who have low self-esteem and self-confidence. It can become very dangerous for them because they might start to internalize that and they might start to see that as, this is my fault. This was destined to happen. I'm putting it in with my working model. My working model already told me I was unsafe. And so I had some responsibility in this, even if that's not the case. Um, using attachment theory in session. So what I do when I'm doing therapy with individuals is I'm looking at linking our expressions and expressions of fear and anger to disturbances and attachment. So we're going to go back to some of our attachment history. We're going to look at where things came from. Um, we're going to try and establish a primary attachment figure. And we're going to help develop that secure attachment. This can happen with adults. There's a lot of repair work that can happen between adults and their parents. Um, throughout the life cycle. Um, if I'm seeing families, we want to talk to families about the child's behavior. We want to talk to how it might relate to attachment anxiety. Sometimes 
it's hard to see behavior and not think that it's willful and the child's just being bad. And so it's a lot of psychoeducation on what does that behavior mean? Is this child truly not love you when they're, when they're not, you know, being comforted by you or they're refusing to get comforted by you or is this attachment anxiety and how can we overcome it? And then we use interventions to reestablish positive attachments between guardians and the children. Um, we do this with uh, biological parents. We do this with extended families. We do this with all different types of family situations out there. Really we want to make sure that if there is a safe primary attachment figure for a child that we can connect that child with that attachment and, and help start the secure to secure it. And then for everybody, we always look for attachment injury and history. Um, talking about therapy as a semi-secure attachment. Uh, therapists, uh, this is a job. And as much as I would absolutely love to be there for one of all of my clients all of the time, I can't. It's not, it's not possible. I am not a good secure attachment figure for them because this is a profession and there's a lot of things that can happen. They need somebody who's reliable in their life to be a secure attachment. However, therapy can provide a semi-secure attachment. Um, the five pillars of creating a secure attachment in therapy is to regard the attachment figure as stronger as wiser, stronger and wiser. So as a therapist, I wanna make sure that I'm able to provide uh, information to them and, and to be an emotional strength. Um, we'll seek proximity through emotional closeness. So we'll have regular meetings. Um, my office is always a safe place. You can be angry in my office. You can be sad in my office. You can be happy in my office and we're all okay with that. Um, this is an emotional place where whatever you pour out into it, it's okay and I can take it. Um, use attachment figures as a safe haven when they feel threatened. So again, therapy, this is a spot where I want them to bring emotional distress and I want to explore difficult memories with them. And then I want to be able to safely help them box those memories up so that they don't have them just spilling out all over the place when they walk out of my office and they don't feel like they're lost outside of my office. So that's a part of me creating an attachment with people is being able to show like, hey, we can unbox the difficult memory and then we can we can put it away and we can explore it at another time too. And then see the secure attachment figure, the secure base, finding that therapy is a safe place to explore stress. The connection I have with clients is super important. The connection that you guys have with your therapists or the people you see have with their therapists is incredibly important. Um, it actually is, counts for about 30% of the healing process is the connection they have with a the therapist. So if you ever run into a situation where you don't feel like you have a good connection with your therapist, or you run into somebody else who feels like they don't have a good connection with their therapist, we always advocate like, please find a, con find a therapist you have a good connection with. Keep looking. It's okay. It has, it, it's a really normal part of our job that not everybody can create a secure attachment with us. And we want them to be able to have that because it's such an important part. Um, and then uh, they fear the separation of attachment figures. So um, this is true with therapy. It's not my favorite part of therapy. You know, when we're discharging, it can be kind of painful on both the therapist and the client because usually we've built a, a long-standing relationship and we've gone through all of these attachments. And so, of course, there's going to be a little pain when we end. Um, and part of my job as a therapist is to help us go through the separation process in a healthy way. We're going to prepare for it. We're going to um, make sure that we can develop a secure attachment other places, that we have other supports that we can use before our therapy relationship is over at all costs. That does not always happen. I've had lots of people surprise discharge on me. And it's like, oh, I, this is not how I wanted that to go. But in best case scenario, we want to be able to to give them a break that isn't sudden and doesn't feel like they got left behind to reinforce that, that negative worldview. We want to give them a positive one of like, I am love, I am safe, and I can detach from this semi-secure attachment without any injury to myself. Um, as we move into telehealth, the telehealth part of this, I want to ask you guys a question um, about how you interact with the people that you're helping. Is telehealth one of the ways you interact or is it primarily in person? Our CASA says it's primarily in person. Okay. During COVID, we did have to do some Zoom visits or Google Meets visits, but it's in person. Okay. So it, you guys have kind of gone back to in person to post COVID? Yes. Okay. 
so we'll talk a little bit about telehealth in this next section. And uh, it sounds like it doesn't directly apply to you guys in terms of how you guys interact with the people you're helping. Um, but we can definitely talk about the benefits of telehealth therapy for people that you're helping. Like it, there, there's often a bit of a barrier for clients um, in trying to use telehealth when talking to therapists. They might feel uncomfortable with it or feel like it may not be as effective. Um, and so this next section is really discussing how we can make telehealth be effective, particularly with people who have attachment disorders um, or attachment uh, injuries. The last section was, you know, I, I spent the whole time talking about the importance of like connecting and, and being close to each other and that primary attachment um, figure. And now we're going to move into kind of like a dis disjointed one of telehealth, but I'm going to try and bring you guys along with me and say that even though there are, uh, there's a lot of physical in-person components to uh, helping people with attachment injuries, we can do it over telehealth and there's a big benefit to it, particularly when we are living in a state that has a lot of rural areas. And again, we can't get to every place. So we're going to talk about specifically telehealth with children. Um, but I will honestly tell you that when it comes to telehealth, um, I will, there is no difference between how I interact with children on telehealth and adults on telehealth, um, because it, it's good practice. It's, it's best practice for any age range. Um, there's a couple of different things we might do for very young children. But if I have a, an adult who needs that kind of support, I've definitely done all of these things with adults, it just depends on where they are emotionally and what needs they have. So it says children know that it can apply to adults too. Um, in fact, play therapy, it's kind of a fun one. We, it's primarily for children, but there's a lot of play therapy techniques we use in adult, tele, in adult sessions in general. Um, and they can be really important and, and productive for the people who need them. So let's talk a little bit about what makes telehealth different from an in-person meeting with a therapist. The internet is, is probably like, I should just have that as a big, bold thing here. Just be like, the internet makes it different. Uh, you're not in the room with me. You're not here in, in this specific place where I am. And that takes a lot away from um, how I can assess, how you can get my feelings, how you can assess me as a client. Um, it takes away a lot of the nonverbal ways that we communicate. Um, and it can, it really changes some of the, the format of what therapy looks like. Um, my office certainly doesn't look like a, I don't think it looks like a typical therapist's office. Um, but even so it has, it's in an office building. It has uh, a feeling about it. That's very different than being in your house, in your living room, um, and when you're doing telehealth, sometimes that's where telehealth happens. It happens just wherever you are and wherever you are at that time. What we see is a lot less formality. Um, we see clients in their house. We can see what's around the client. Um, we want to be aware that when we're seeing clients in their house, we want clients to be aware that when we see clients in their house, that we can see what's around them. <laughs> um, we want to make sure that they are aware that um, when they're presenting themselves to us, they're doing it in a way that they, they want to and they feel comfortable to. Um, there's a, I don't think I've ever seen anything uh, that was not appropriate during a telehealth session, but I do, I did hear stories and I have interacted with some teachers who have had situations that when they were doing telehealth um, as a teacher, they would see like there'd be a gun in the background of a student's house. Um, and so kind of just making people aware of the fact that like this is, this is a less formal situation. I don't expect you to clean your house by any means. That's not uh, even the least of my concerns. But if there's something that you don't want me to know, I want you to be aware that I can see what's around you. On that note, there's also a privacy issue. If you don't live alone, they want to make sure that we can try and limit the amount of people who are around you so that your privacy is protected um, and try and limit the amount of people who come in and out. 
Um, with kids, this is a really big thing with uh, siblings. Siblings will come in and out or they'll have friends over and they'll just like go to a different room and then the friend will walk in and it'll be like, okay, well, we have to be aware that this needs to be a private location. Um, telehealth is more apt for distractions. There's a lot more stuff around them. There is a lot more ways to kind of avoid and, and be resistant towards treatment if it's an uncomfortable situation. I have less control over the environment. Um, in my office, if I know that we're going to be talking about something difficult, I can either make sure that I can provide things like fidget toys or distractions as needed, or I can remove them um, if we need to have focus on something. When I'm doing telehealth, I don't have that control over the environment. Um, sometimes the parents don't have control over the environment or or if they may not think about having control over the environment. I've talked to many kids who have been like off screen messing with something and I'm like, what are we doing? Um, if I need stuff for the uh, a set, like if I need stuff for whatever the activity we're doing in therapy is, I have to be able to communicate with the parents and the parents have to be able to provide that information that that equipment you know usually i try and make it really easy like crayons and paper or something to draw with and paper um but i've been in situations where that's not even a possibility they just didn't they didn't have that available um and then we talk about parental involvement when we're talking about children over telehealth um what kind of parents do we have there's really two types of parents i'm sure that there are three because there's always a perfect parent but i feel like most parents are in one of these two realms there are those that like to hover um and they will either be just off screen and they'll be being like tell them about when this happened tell them about how you were feeling last week when you were crying and like i can hear them i can't see them but i can hear them and the kids clearly can see them because i can i watch the kids eyes um or maybe the parent is just in the room the entire time and so trying to set boundaries with parents and and, and remind them that like they can trust me with the child and, and that they don't need to be there to, to provide that. The other type of parents are the non-existent parents. I will honestly tell you that if my kid was in therapy, this would be my realm. This is where I would be. Um, probably most of the time, I'd probably go between both, but the non-existent parents are the ones who are like, okay, I want to give you absolute privacy, but then they seem to like disappear. And, and so like, if we do need them, it's very difficult to get them. And so whenever I have a child over telehealth, I do want to talk to parents and talk about like, hey, I need to be able to get a hold of you if we need you. But at the same time, I want you to can do privacy. Like, how can we arrange this situation? Um, and it's really not that difficult. Most of the time, it just involves me being able to text the parent if I need them to come into the room. It's not really been a big issue. Um, it's always a bigger issue when I haven't talked to them about it and we get into a situation where they're like, oh, yeah, I just ran to the store. And I'm like, hold on, <laughs> I, can't, I can't have you just running to the store because I, I can't be in charge of a seven year old during a therapy session via telehealth. Um, and so as long as we're talking and, and parents usually are very receptive about it, um, talking to them about the, the needs during sessions, even if they're in the house. The other thing about telehealth is the accessibility issues. Um, not everybody is really, really great at the computer. Not all kids, contrary to popular belief, are really great at the computer. Um, and so we run into accessibility issues and getting two people. And then at the same time, we have some ease in accessibility for people who aren't able to attend in person. Um, I have a lot of um, low income families that don't have vehicles. And without telehealth, it would not be possible for them to take their kids to, to therapy. And, and the issues that arise with that, um, I always feel like every time I always bring that up with somebody, I, the, the insurance part of my brains are like, well, they could just call Medicaid to get them to pick up. That's not always the most accessible route for people. And it's actually really difficult to try and navigate. And so this makes it accessible to families that wouldn't otherwise be able to have therapy. Advantages of telehealth um, are flexibility, reduction in, in travel, less concern about the weather, which has been a big thing. I have honestly missed, ooh, we've had dangerous weather once a week for the last four weeks in a row um, where I haven't been able to be in an office. So 
Less concerns about the weather is a real plus. Everybody who's on telehealth, we've usually been able to maintain our appointments. Um, flexibility, it opens up the schedule for the therapist and the parent. We have wonderful parents out there who are hardworking every day and getting to therapy, staying through therapy, and then transporting back from therapy is a good chunk of their time and it's really difficult for them to make that. So having telehealth makes it easy for us to see clients. Um, it really reduces the amount of time that the therapy takes overall and, and gives them a chance to be able to experience therapy without the concerns of uh, getting places and, and getting back. Um, it allows us to see clients in rural and distant cities. Um, I have seen clients all over the state and I've learned so many different cities out there that I didn't even know existed. Um, and then it allows access to professionals who specialize. So with telehealth, um, I know that in our office, EMDR is, is available, but there's a long wait list. If somebody's willing to see telehealth, there is telehealth EMDR without a wait list. And so I can refer to people so they don't have to wait on long wait lists or they have access to those people um, without necessarily having to drive a long distance. In terms of comfort, kids and adults might be more willing to open up when they can talk to their therapist from the comfort of their home. Um, they will have comforting objects around them. It kind of provides a sense of stability for them. Um, and it, it can be really uninvasive. Um, and then they can provide direct information about their home life by showing and telling. And this is really important with little kids because uh, little kids are still uh, mostly proto-language. They use a lot of hand signaling and body language. And when I'm using telehealth, they can provide me information about their home life by showing me, oh, look what I've made, or this is what, this is what my bed looks like. Um, and I've really used this to work with children who've had a lot of different struggles. So like we had a kid that that really struggled sleeping through the night and waking up with nightmares. And so because of telehealth, we were able to like look at the bed and, and arrange it in a way that made them feel safe. And then there's a lot of direct support that comes with uh, telehealth. It's the ability to schedule sessions to coincide with easier or more difficult parts of the day. If we have people that really struggle in the morning, um, like on their way to work or on their way to school, we can schedule those at that time to help them get that boost. If they need more help at night, we can schedule those. Um, it gives us a little bit of flexibility there. And then it also allows us to see clients in multiple locations. So like I said, I work with Heart of Iowa um, and I have been able with telehealth to see families while they are in Heart of Iowa, which is a treatment facility. And then as they move through the halfway house uh, program and then as they move into their own house and there really wasn't a big disruption to them because we had already established good telehealth. Barriers of telehealth are going to be body language. You can only see this little box of me. Um, and I'm actually a really good person to do an example of this. I don't know if you can see all of them, but I'm a big hands talker. And Zoom is not great for hands talking. <laughs> you can't see very much of my uh, big expressions. Um, and this is important when we talk to little kids. They are also usually very big into, like I said, proto-language. They use the tone of their voice and their body language and moving around as part of their, um, a part of their, of their communication. And so when I can only see a teeny tiny little box of them, it does make it more difficult for me to understand them and to, to get that communication. It does make it difficult for to us to use activities that require cooperative movement. Um, when it comes to attachment therapy um, and creating secure attachments, we do a lot of cooperative movement. We do a lot of rocking with family therapy. We want um, parents or caregivers to hold the children. Um, and when I say child, I do mean like 12 year olds will even incorporate movement into there. And so, Without having an ability to coordinate that movement because of telehealth, it restricts some of the interventions we can do. And then the last one is like the floating head syndrome, which is, again, a, a, an artifact of the COVID era when everybody suddenly became just like a floating head. Um, it's easy for our brains to kind of disassociate this from a real person. I'm just somebody on a screen. I'm 2D. Um, whereas if we were in person and you were sitting next to me, I would see much more 
uh, grounded, I'd be more real. Um, this is particularly difficult with kids because they see oftentimes they have a lot of media representations in that floating head. They watch YouTube, they play video games, and it's all very 2D and not real. And so then I can get easily put into that category as a therapist because I'm also looking very 2D and not real. Lack of privacy, um, hard to find quiet private space at home. Hard to find a place that doesn't have toys, electronics, or people. That does not mean that I don't let kids have toys around them during therapy. In fact, I usually love it when they do. But it's it's difficult for us to like move away from electronics if we're using that electronic to communicate. And I think kids think that they're the sneakiest people in the world and they'll like pull up an extra tab and they'll be like, they have no idea I'm playing a game over here when I can very clearly tell that they're playing a game on another tab. And I can't really do anything about that as a therapist. And and I also understand from the parental view, like, that's hard. What are you going to do? Like lock down the browser? That's, that's a pretty difficult thing to do. And so we have these built-in distractions that we may not be able to get rid of. So we just have to work with them. Um, it's also easier for the client to use disengagement as a form of resistance. We're going to talk a little bit about different types of resistance. Um, but disengagement is a really big a trauma response. If I can't deal with something, I might just not engage with it. Um, when we were watching the uh, still face video, you saw the little girl have some disengagement. When mom wasn't responding, she looked away from the camera. She, she looked away from her mom and looked at the camera. Um, she, she disengaged from that before coming back to see if she could restart the process. That disengagement will continue throughout your life. Like all of us use disengagement at some point. Um, as a way of dealing with the situation. Um, in a therapy office, I might help construct my room so that it, either we have good disengagement skills, like I might have something specific for the kids to disengage with, or I might make it a little harder for them to disengage, again, not to make them in pain or to cause psychological distress, but to encourage them to continue to engage or to help them reorient back to me. And then my favorite is technical issues. I don't know where everybody is on this call, uh, Iowa-wise, but if you live in Vinton or anywhere near Vinton, Iowa, I have to tell you, you guys have the worst internet. And I don't know why, but every time I see somebody in Vinton, I just cannot seem, maybe it's the Cedar Rapids Vinton connection. I'm not, I'm not I, I feel bad, I shouldn't blame Vinton. Um, but internet connections are a really big problem. And, and it, it it can become problematic, like if the wind blows the wrong way, or we might have times when we may not be able to afford the internet. It can become problems during dangerous weather when uh, the internet's getting destructive. And internet connections cause a ton of telehealth barriers. Um, it is also limited ways to connect with a therapist through technology. Um, again, we've lost a lot of our body language and outside proto-language um, ways of communicating. So we're really looking at talking. And if we're really lucky, then direct eye contact. Um, even as I am talking here to you now, I don't actually even get to have direct eye contact with you. Partially like, you know, because just like everybody else, like just turn off your video. Like then I can do other things and I don't have to have my video on. And partially because like, even if you guys had your videos on all the time, I'm having to flick between different slides and, and look at things. And so um, our ways of connecting, even in this meeting are limited. And that happens in therapy too. Um, changing between different platforms. This is a big issue that we run into. Um, like my company made a big change from Doxy to Zoom. And so then try and figure out the differences and teach all the parents and children out there about the differences and getting them to connect was uh, an ordeal. And then the ability of the client to engage with technology. So once again, not all clients are super magic geniuses at the internet. I certainly am not a super magic genius at the internet. Um, I've definitely run into people who've really, really struggled with like um, being able to sign in, being able to make like with Zoom, getting into the calls and, and turning stuff on and giving permissions for like the, the voice and the video and all of that. It's, it's more complicated than it initially seems. There are common client resistant types. Um, so client resistance happens in all situations. 
everybody has client resistance. Um, I, as a client to whatever therapist I would see would have resistance. Um, and when we are talking about telehealth therapy, particularly telehealth therapy with kiddos and adults who've experienced attachment uh, injury, we want to be aware that like that resistance is going to be a big part. We're going to see a lot of resistance and we're going to want to be able to track it and we're going to want to be able to figure out ways to get through it. Um, when it comes with client resistance for attachment issues, we see some lack of focus issues. We see these ignoring and under the big heading of ignoring. So we might lack a focus or refusal to answer questions or participate. I don't trust who I'm talking to, so I'm just not going to participate. Uh, and then on top of that, like I said, we put telehealth where it's a lot easier to ignore me. So um, another common client resistance type is lashing out. So we might become verbal or physically angry, um, or we might have passive aggressive behaviors. Um, in telehealth world, verbal and physical anger isn't as big of a deal. Most of the time we don't see that happen, but I have to be aware of it because I don't have a way of really co-regulating with that client. So like, particularly if I'm seeing a young client in my office and they become dysregulated and they become very distraught and are, are throwing everything around, I can co-regulate with them using my body as a tool um, and, and helping them to calm down when they're doing that at home. I don't have that ability. And I usually have to reach out to a parent to help that regulation go on. Um, refusals are a really big common client resistance. Uh, a big bad case of the nose is what I think of when I think of little kids. It's when you start to ask them every question and it doesn't matter what you ask, it's gonna be no. How was your day? No. Do you like doing this? No. How's your cat? No, it's just all these no's. And it's, it's a refusal based off of anxiety. Um, it's not even a real attention to what the problem is or the question is. It's just, I'm saying no, because I'm anxious and because I don't feel good in this situation. So I'm resisting. Um, we might also see apprehension. Um, and then the last, but not, not you, the, the, I'm not going to say the least. The last but not a very common one we see is fawning. And so sometimes we'll have kids that come in and they'll agree with everything. And I will tell you that sometimes I see this in particular with kids who've had um, multiple homes in their life, whether that be adoption or foster or just struggles in their family life where they've gone through different houses. Um, fawning becomes a type of resistance of like, I don't have any say in what I'm doing anyway, so I'll just say yes to everything. It's, it's like the opposite of the big bad case of the nose. Um, they've really disassociated from the process. They're saying yes, but they're not engaging. Um, they're just saying yes to, to get through it. So let's talk about making up for body language. Does anybody know who this guy is? Also a good way for me to check to make sure you're seeing the same slide I'm on. <laughs> Well, his body language right there is a positive body language. It is a positive body language. So this guy's name is Blippi. Blippi is an is a internet personality, I guess. He was very, very popular, um, particularly during COVID. Um, and Blippi is kind of what I like try and get people to understand as the ideal for young kids. Um, when we are talking about telehealth, with children, again, with children who are already a little resistant, we want to exaggerate the things that we're losing. For losing body language, I suddenly have to make my body language a lot bigger. Um, where I might just normally say like, high five to a normal uh, 12 year old or something. When I'm over telehealth and I'm dealing with a kid, I'm gonna be like, high five. I'm gonna make a really big gesture to make sure that they can see my body language. And I'm gonna act a little bit like this guy. Um, and he's, we're gonna watch a very short video of him, um, but he's super exaggerated. Um, it allows the kid to see what we're saying and get that feeling. It's, it's increasing our volume on this side of the screen so that it comes through louder on the other side, uh, our body language volume. Um, when we're talking about increasing body language um, for telehealth therapy, we'll talk about increased tracking of the kid's body language. So I might suddenly 
be a lot more attentive to, oh, I see you stood up. Oh, you sat down. Oh, I see you're thinking really hard. I can see because you're touching your chin. I'm going to make sure that they can, they know that I'm focused on them and I'm paying attention to them. Um, I'm going to give big blippy reactions to younger kids. I'm going to be not just happy that you did that. I'm going to be happy that you did that. I'm going to change the inflection of my voice to help increase the, the amount of connection we can have. And then I'm going to create an environment that incorporates the technology that we have. And so um, the youngest I have ever seen on telehealth is three-year-old boy. And when you're doing telehealth with a three-year-old, that's it's a bit challenging. Um, as anybody who's ever tried to uh, Zoom call grandkids or Zoom call anybody that's under the age of five, um, being with technology and young children is an adventure. And you're always going to go on a ride because they'll take you everywhere they go with you. Especially if you're on a phone, they'll just walk around with it. Um, and so I want to make sure that if we're if we're restricted to telehealth, I'm going to use it. I'm going to make it part of what we're doing. I'm going to, if you turn your phone sideways, I'm going to turn sideways too. I'm going to fall over. If you, if you put me face down, I'm going to say, oh my gosh, it's so dark in here. Oh my gosh, I'm afraid of the dark. Oh, and I'm going to make sure that they, they continue to see that I'm interacting with them and we're going to use technology as part of our interaction. That also helps alleviate some of that floating head syndrome we were talking about. It makes me more real because I'm able to react. When you have a YouTube video, if you put it down, it's not gonna sit there and say, oh no, you put me down. If you put me down, I'm a real person. I know you put me down. And so I'm gonna interact with you in that way. Okay, we're just gonna watch a little bit of Lippy because I think it's just really fun. Um, I think oftentimes adults watch this and it's a little bit like, maybe the right word is cringy. <laughs> um, but it's important to understand that kids don't have the same social exposure that you do as an adult. They don't have however many years of social exposure. And so this can be really exciting. And and this is uh, another person. So this is a blippy is a guy on the internet who's making up for the fact that he is on the internet and how can he be engaging as a two dimensional character to learn about it'll make you want to shout flippy oh hey it's me blippy do you see what i'm doing i'm painting yeah i'm actually painting just a regular cardboard box check it out see i took this cardboard box and i'm painting it do you know what I'm painting and making? I'm actually gonna make a lemonade stand. Yeah, I love lemonade. It's so yummy. But a lemonade stand isn't used just to drink your own lemonade. It's so then you can sell lemonade to others. <laughs> yeah. So the first thing that you have to do is make a very good looking lemonade stand so then everyone will want to come try your lemonade. So now that it's all painted, I have these yellow triangle ribbons. <laughs> and if I put them on here, he is probably enough for you guys to get the idea of the fact that he uses an exaggerated tone of voice and he goes up and down in his vocal range to make up for the lost body language and the lost connection he has over the internet. And kids really do respond to this, particularly younger kids. I will honestly tell you, I will do this with uh, teenagers if they need if they need it. And when I say if they need it, I mean like if they're giving me the, the flat affect and I want them to come join me and, and give me a little bit more, um, I will definitely blippy them and they will make fun of me ruthlessly. They'll be like, you sound just like a kid's character. And I'm like, I do. No way. And it, it provides, again, that connection of like, I know that I sound like a kid's character. They're calling me out on it. I'm not upset about it. And we can have a moment of that connection. Um, and it brings them back, usually to a much younger stage. Because aside from Blippi, there's generations of Blippi-like characters. I mean, Mr. Rogers was a big one when I was a kid. Um, Sesame Street were really big of those big exaggerated movements and exaggerated characters and it can help bring them back too. 
we're going to talk about mirroring for a moment and um we're going to talk about mirror neurons and mirror neurons are we're going to get all sciencey here mirror neurons are these neurons in your brains that specifically mirror things they, that you see um and they are essential to how we learn uh, mirror neurons help us from birth on and how we recognize the world around us, how we imitate the world around us, and how we learn how to manipulate. Um, so typical mirror neuron activity you might see, especially in little young babies, is when you stick out their tongue, they stick out their tongue. They are, their neurons are activating before they even stick out the tongue. So even at the beginning of that process, when you're just sticking your tongue out at them and they aren't putting their tongue out, their brain is already starting to try and figure that out using their mirror neurons. They're seeing you do it. They're getting some of the joy from it. Oh no, taking Blippi off, new slide. Okay. So remember how I was saying that technology issues are a big part of telehealth? <laughs> this is what I was meaning. <laughs> that it doesn't seem to matter how many times you've done something, it just inevitably will go wrong at some point. There wasn't a lot to see on the slide, but I'm glad we're right on the same page again. <laughs> so the positive effects of mirroring. Um, mirroring is also a really big part about why YouTube became really, really popular, why TikTok became really, really popular, why uh, Vine became really, really popular if you're old enough for the olden days of Vine. Um, it is a part of how we can enjoy things too. So mirror neurons are able to if we watch somebody doing something, we can get a little bit of the enjoyment that they have. Um, so watching video games can make it feel a little bit like we're playing video games. It's about a 10% return, they say. Um, mirror neurons are really, really important in terms of therapy. Um, it's why we can watch videos together and get therapeutic benefit from it. It's why using telehealth, we can have therapeutic benefit from our facial expressions. Um, as a therapist, we use our mirror neurons to help regulate their clients. And so if a client becomes dysregulated, I can use my face and my body to help calm them just because they're looking at me and their brain is trying to become congruent. They are getting some of the benefits of my calmness. On the reverse side, if I am super high and excited and I go into my blippy mode, I can kind of pull them along with me too and get some of those mirror neurons to give them that boost um, to get them to be uh, more effective uh, and show, show more. In terms of teaching mirror neuron, neuron mirror, using mirror neurons to parents, um, I always try and tell them that like it's, it's valid. It's a really great way to do it. It feels kind of silly on one side of the screen, particularly if you're talking to little kids and you have to be blippy. Um, but experiencing things together watching things together. If you guys um, can't be in the same room, even watching movies together uh, can be a positive effect. Having your voice, having that movie in front can feel a little bit like you guys are in the same room together. Use mirror neurons to your advantage as a parent or as a person or as a therapist. Allow them to do some of the work. Um, and then if you want to teach something as my job as often in therapy is, is to help provide coping skills. We can watch other people go through coping skills or we can practice or watch other people practice coping skills and get some of the benefits out of that. Okay, Plax, er, uh, platform issues with uh, telehealth are kind of like what you just saw a minute ago. Um, for some reason, Zoom will do this thing where like the video gets stuck Different platforms have different issues. Different platforms have different advantages. Doxy.me is one that you'll see a lot of therapists use. Um, one, the free version is free, so that's helpful. Um, but on top of that, Doxy.me is really accessible. It's a very, very short link. You can text it, and all they have to do is tap it, and it will pull it up on their phone. Um, if I ever have clients that really struggle with technology, I will always go to doxy.me because I can direct them. Like even on the phone, I've told people, okay, now use your finger and touch, touch the words, the blue words, and then it'll help them figure out how to get it. Um, it's just a very, very easy 
platform to use. It does have drawbacks um, without having like the expensive paid for version. There's no video share and video share is really important. If you can imagine this entire mission, this entire meeting here without video share, it would literally just be me talking for three hours and it would probably be awful for all the people involved. Um, video share is a central part of therapy. It's, it's a way for us to connect. It's a way for this to not just be a talking head syndrome. Um, so it's a real disadvantage if we don't have that. Zoom and Google Meets do allow video sharing, but they have limited time structures and they have some other issues. Um, like with Zoom, you sometimes have to go through a longer process to get into it. It takes a little bit more tech savviness. Um, Google Meets requires you to have a Google account, I think. So again, that's uh, another step. Doing telehealth through the telephone is possible and I do do it with all ages. Um, it is harder with younger kids. It's harder with people who really need to have all of the, the abilities of uh, reading body language because the telephone removes everything from that. We are just a voice at that point. And that can be really dis, uh, disjointed for clients who, who are having a hard time sharing. Um, and it's pretty difficult for me as a therapist too because uh, I can't do a full assessment on the telephone. I, I'm not able to see how you look. I'm not able to see your reactions. I can't tell how congruent your, your facial expressions are to your, what you're saying. Um, it's, a, it's a bit of a challenge and it's usually like last resort. We can't figure out anything else, we'll do telephone. Um, and most of the time, if I have to do telephone, I really try and keep it to just sometimes telephone. So we'll usually have telehealth through Doxy or Zoom um, before or regularly, and then every once in a while for telephone. So this is, it can be helpful if you have a client that moves between houses and getting new people trained is difficult. You can be really helpful if you have a client that um, is displaced for one reason or another and suddenly they don't have a computer or, or a phone that's available to do um, internet stuff. I've had a lot of clients who just really struggle with maintaining uh, internet on their phone and that might be their only way to connect. Over the phone, difficult. We have to adjust our interventions. Um, there's a limited ability to engage. It's difficult to provide structure to a session. And so when we do it verbally, it, it sessions look really different. Um, I might have a really clear beginning and ending part of my sessions so that it is like there's a good even structure and we can make sure that we're closing out session and not leaving a bunch of open emotions. Um, and then it's difficult to encourage engagement from the client. Um, especially a lot of really young kids are not used to having just phone sections. The phone conversations are just not super common with them and they might be, get really distracted or be really unable to engage with me that way. Okay, so the last part of this section we have here is interventions. Um, and in the therapy world, interventions are the ways that we help provide treatment. Um, they help us achieve our goals. And we have all different types of interventions for all different ages and all different activities. Um, some interventions work really well with some clients, some interventions don't. And sometimes as therapists, we don't know until we've tried that out. So these are all going to be telehealth interventions um, and they're all gonna be telehealth interventions that help us build and change that the attachment inner working model from our attachment style that we talked about earlier. Uh, so the interventions we're gonna look at is playing games online, hide and seek and scavenger hunt, emoji talking, choose your own adventure. And then we'll talk about online dollhouse and sand tray activities. Um, sand tray might be something that you guys are familiar with. It's a pretty big hot topic in the play therapy world. And there is ways that we can do that online and still provide the benefits we would if we were in office. So games online. Um, typically, I would make you all get on and play a game of Uno with me. I won't do that. This is a really, really big group. Um, but I want you guys to know that uh, in terms of being able to very quickly interact with somebody, using buddy board games online is one of my favorite. 
Um, it doesn't require any extra downloads. Um, if you guys type in this or click on this link, um, actually, I don't know if you can click on the link. I'll put the link in the chat. It'll take you right to it. It doesn't require a real name. This is all really, really helpful for if you have to engage quickly and you don't have, um, you don't have a lot of time to download stuff, to get stuff installed. And it's, it's super, super convenient and helpful. It also has a ton of different games. Uno is probably the one I have played the most because it tends to be the most accessible as a therapist. We can do a lot of different things with Uno. I will tell you, I have played Battleship and chess on here. I'm just not good at chess. So if you're really great at chess, maybe somebody can try it out and let me know how that goes. Um, you guys can uh, use this to make private rooms. There's also like a nice little feature where you can like do expressions to each other. Um, when working with children that have attachment issues, giving them as many different ways to express themselves as possible is a real positive. Um, I know that in the past when I've worked with clients who've had attachment issues, they will find their own ways to express themselves. I have had a, a wonderful young boy who expresses himself through flags. And I know exactly how he's feeling by which flags he, of the countries he's showing me. And that's fun. Um, just providing a lot of different fun and creative ways to express and create our connection and a better way for me to be able to connect with the client um, and, and start to, to provide that secure base so we can start uh, working towards changing that inner working model. Games in general are fantastic. Um, uh, I advocate that everybody in their life play games all the time. Maybe not all the time, um, but as much as you can, board games and games, card games are really, really great ways for us to interact with each other. Um, it's really great ways to teach children a variety of skills. It teaches them self-regulation. It teaches them um, the efforts that go into social engagement and the benefits you can reap from that. Um, one of the first thing I always try and teach kids, particularly kids with really severe behavioral problems. Um, so I'm talking about like uh, children who bite, children that hit, that kick, children that break things, playing board games and, and uh, card games. One of the first things we always go through um, and we start out super easy for them, but that level of social interaction provides so many useful skills to them that we can work at as a base from that interaction. Usually just learning how to play a good game of go fish can give us a basis to work on a lot of other coping skills. It also, games are a great way to have breaks in conversation. So we talked before a little bit about making sure that we have appropriate ways to disengage or to have resistance. I am a therapist. I don't expect everyone to not have resistance in therapy, particularly kids. And so I might want to provide ways that they can have that. If we're going to talk about something very difficult and they need time to think or to manage emotions, then we can play a game while we're talking. And that gives them an opportunity for appropriate breaks that still go with the flow and still allow us to move forward. Um, playing games, again, increases attachment and improves social skills. Um, the advantages and disadvantages of playing games, I honestly will tell you the advantages, I think, outweigh the disadvantages, but you will run into situations where there are some really low thresholds for people's tolerance. Young kids who've been through a lot of trauma have a difficult time losing. It is, it is, again, that's part of that inner working model that they can't articulate that makes it seem that losing a game, even though it's just a game, is as dangerous as, as taking some of the biggest risks you can imagine. And, and they just cannot handle the stress and anxiety that come from that. And so practicing losing those games are important, but we might have to start on such a level where, um, and I'm a big believer in not just letting people win, but we might start on a level of game where we're really cooperative. Um, I want them to feel secure in their wins, but I might make sure that we success, we set up for success in the beginning. So they get a good amount of success. And then as we start to build up our tolerance, we'll have some um, set up disadvantages, some plans for like what's going to happen if we don't win. And then we'll go back to having that set up for success. It's just like when we were talking attachment style, I have to go through showing them a lot of the good, knowing that we can make it through the bad, 
and that we're not going to get into one of those situations where it's ugly again, where they're just going to keep losing and losing and losing and, and reinforcing that negative worldview. Huge proponent of games. Um, I like literally keep decks of cards around me all the time. And it's one of the easiest things that you can give to anybody. They're super duper affordable and super cheap. And there's about a thousand games you can play with a deck of cards. Um, and it really is an important tool. And if you don't play games at home, this is your sponsor to tell you, yes, sponsored ad for telling you you should play games. Go and find a game. Think of ones you played as kids. They still make Sorry. They still make Trouble. They still make Monopoly. Um, go and play them again and, and experience the, the social interactions that come from them. Okay, hide and seek and scavenger hunt. When we talk about children with attachment injury, we see a lot of hide and seek play. Um, that is, that can be like the really literal hide and seek play where they'll come into my office. I have a lovely little girl that hides under the chairs in our, um, in our waiting room every single time. And hide and seek play is an important part of them establishing what kind of uh, caregiver you are or what kind of person supporter you are are you a person who's going to come and look for them um are you going to come look for them even if they've been bad are you going to come and look for them are you are you are they worth coming to look for um and so when we have children who've had a good deal of trauma we might play hide and seek over and over and over again and then we might change it a little bit um and hide and seek might be now i'm hiding an item and that item is kind of representative of me. You have to over and over again. Um, maybe I'm burying the item in sand. Again, it's about, am I important enough to be found? Um, when we're talking about telehealth, hide and seek is obviously a little bit more challenging. There aren't a lot of places to hide in the online world. Um, but what we can play are scavenger hunts that are very hide and seek-esque, or we can play a really, really rudimentary version of hide and seek um, this works great with little kids um, where you will see them kind of like drift off and dissociate and I'm going to bring them back by being like, wait, I can't see you. Wait, I can only, I can only see this much of you. I can't see what your face is doing. And then we're, we're going to have our engagement through that. And then maybe they'll go off the screen and they'll come back and they'll pretend to be somebody different. And my job in that is to, again, be like, oh no, where is so-and-so? Where did they go? I want to make sure I'm maintaining that interaction. Scavenger hunts are really fun. Um, it really answers the am I cared for questions. Um, we might include items of attachment or emotional values. So I might, particularly when dealing with kids who have separations from their biological parents or biological families, we might start after we've done a couple of sessions of this asking like, what's something that makes you think of dad? What's something that makes you think of grandma? And um, having them go throughout their house and look for these items and, and bring them back and, and show them to me and, and just experience that moment with them. Um, it doesn't actually involve a lot of talking. It just involves a lot of like, oh, I see you brought this. This is important to you. I see it. I can see you. I can see what you're bringing here. I'm okay. Um, hide and seek and scavenger hunts are really easy games to play as intros and exit or resistance activities. So if I am trying to talk with my own kid over the phone, if I'm like out at a training and I am trying to talk with my own kid over the phone and I want more engagement and they're struggling with that, we might play hide and seek. They might start playing the scavenger hunt or the hide and seek game. Never, you'll never guess where I put in my house. We hide a little figure called Spock. You'll never guess where we put Spock, Mom. Oh, did you put it here? Nope, I didn't put it there. Did you put it here? You know, even though we're just over the phone, I can still engage in some of that that hide and seek mentality. And I'm giving them, I'm giving my own child some of that attachment of what you're saying is important enough. What you are doing, I can see and hear you, even though I can't see you. I can see you and hear you and, and hear your needs. Okay, emoji talk. We are gonna play a little bit of a game here in a second. And I promise it isn't too long. Um, emoji talk is pretty much just talking with emojis. It's very, very popular. Or actually, you know what, it's not anymore. It was really popular for a while, but now it's kind of cringy. 
but that's okay. It's still pretty fun to play with all different varieties and ages. Um, it's a good way as a therapist for us to start connecting our outward expressions, our physical expressions with emotions. Since emojis are usually just an object or a picture, um, how can I interpret that as an emotion? And so I've asked people to explain their dreams to me using emojis. Um, I've asked them to explain how they're feeling using emojis. It gives me a chance to guess wrong or right. Um, and then gives them a chance to then start attaching words to it. So they might send me a frowny face and I'd be like, oh, that means you're sad. And they'll be like, no, it means I got really, really sick. When I get really sick, that's the face I make. And I'll be like, oh, that's your sick face. This is good to know. I wouldn't have ever known that. You know, it gives them a chance to really uh, expound upon what they're trying to present to you. Um, so we're going to play emoji talk. I'm, I am honestly going to make you go through these. Um, go ahead and put in the chat what you think number one is. And while you guys are guessing, I'm going to tell you, I don't have the answers to this. And I am so sorry. So we are going to have to just come to an agreement that if we can't figure it out, that's just what it is. I can't tell you what they are. Um, when I found this, I didn't have answers. So uh, it's really open to interpretation. So can you guys see the emoji talk? It says, guess the film. Oh, okay. Yes, I. We, uh, Emily can see it. So f number one, Emily said Kung Fu Panda. All right. What about number two? Uh, Nikki said up. I think I heard Home Alone. I think this one is up, but I've never heard Home Alone, but now I can kind of see that though. Number three, Nikki got happy feet. That's that's generally, and Joe got happy feet. That's generally what I think most people have agreed on when we've played this game, that that's happy feet. Okay, number four. Spider-Man. Yeah. <laughs> you guys got that one. You got that a lot quicker than other people have. Number five. Yeah, Nikki. I think Nikki's seen a lot of these. Nikki got what we think it is, which is Moana. Number six on the same kind of Disney princess track. Frozen. Yeah. Okay, number seven. This movie's been very popular in my house lately for some reason. Ratatouille. Yes. Uh, okay, number eight. Whatever your guys' best guess on this. This is one of those that I actually don't know the answer to, but I'm always- Aristocats. You think Aristocats? All right. I'm cheating. I have two little ones here telling me the answers. Oh, that's good. All right. Well, do they know the answer to number nine? Lion King. Lion King. I'm actually, hold on. I'm going to go back to number four because I always forget this. Somebody said Spider-Man for number four, but can you tell me which movie is Spider-Man? I want you to look at that one again. Real. Look at the emoji that's way off to the side. Yeah, I'm looking at the, like where he, the dark, when he has the black costume on i don't know i don't remember what it's called so the our best guess on this one is spider-man far from home because oh. it's really far from the house <laughs> the house is a hard one to see because it's like way over by the nine i, don't I, know if you guys can see it I see it now yes i do okay well, let's we'll do we'll do two more here uh what's number 10 curious george would be i don't think i've ever heard anyone guess that but that does fit all right number 11 I like giving this one to kids because apparently this is not a popular movie for children to watch anymore. Is it Tarzan? Or do we already have that one? Wizard we of Oz? Tarzan. I don't think so. I'm fairly certain that this is supposed to be Jungle Book. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. But like, I wish that they, they could have certainly used some more emojis. Like if somebody had to answer this to me in a therapy session, I'd be like, I don't know. I might need some help with that one. Okay. I, I will we'll leave the other ones up for you guys to mess with on your own. Um, that is kind of our talk about emoji talk. It's really just about finding different ways to express ourselves and connect our physical features with our emotions. Next part we're going to talk about is choose your own adventure stories. There's a lot of ways to do this. You will see, oh, I forgot to tell you, there is an inappropriate word on the slide. Um, and there's a, a fairly important reason for that. And I will discuss that. 
Um, but choosing your adventure stories are really, really helpful for children to understand that they have choices. Usually when we become just regulated, our brain becomes very linear and does not see multiple options. And so practicing the skill of seeing options, choosing different options is really important um, with people who struggle to, to have this, those linear thoughts. Um, it also involves a little bit of our narrative techniques. So creating stories is a big part of helping our ways, helping ourselves get through trauma. Um, narrative therapy is about creating our own story, um, often written or visual, um, and, and helping to internalize that story. The uh, link here, the one that says you feel like shit, um, is an adult's version of the game. Well, stop. The adult's version of the game, um, it's not it's not terribly inappropriate beyond this, but it, it is a um, choose your own adventure for depression. So it's really about self-care and depression and like helping you, you know, how do you, how do you get out of this? What choices do you have for taking care of yourself? Um, it's a fun little thing to go through. It's a bit of what we call psychoeducation. So you're learning and playing at the same time. Bonus. Um, it's a really good way of driving home the importance of self-care um, to all people, children, adults, parents, grandparents, the importance that self-care plays in maintaining good mental health, both for you and for the family and support that you're providing. And then online dollhouse and online sand tray. Again, I'll drop these in the um, I'll drop these in the chat. Um, online dollhouse. We use dollhouses a lot to help people represent different scenes or just to understand some of their inner workings. We ask children and adults to show us a little bit like, what does your day look like? What does your mornings look like? Show me what a typical great day looks for you. Show me what a bad day looks for you. Um, with sand tray, it's very similar. It's a little bit more static. There's a lot less movement going on in the sand tray, but it helps us understand where you are mentally and um, helps us see some of those parts of yourself that you may not be good at describing or that may not even come up to your brain to describe verbally. It might just be something that you're used to thinking versus describing and it gives us a picture into it. Both of these were created by a therapist. She's a fabulous. Um, I do enjoy the fact that these online dollhouses and online sand tray, um, even though they're limited, are really multicultural. They have lots of different uh, family situations that are available. So like if you're creating a family, you can really look like your family. They have a lot of different characters available. And even though it seems kind of simplistic, I've found that even older kids can get into it. I want to drive home the idea that attachment theory plays an important role in our lives. It starts as young children and it will continue to affect your life throughout your entire life. The attachment theory helps us develop and determine how we're going to use our coping skills and our psychological resistance towards trauma. Um, and that attachment theory can impact how we get our treatment through therapy um, and that we can still have effective therapy even if it is not the easiest for attachment therapy their attachment issues so when we talk about telehealth it's certainly not our first go-to when we think attachment issues but it shouldn't be ruled out as a non go like as and not an option if it's if it's telehealth or nothing please take telehealth there's a lot of good that can happen from that. If you have a client who says, oh, I just can't make it, please encourage telehealth. There's a lot of the good that can come from that. Um, therapists genuinely want to be able to access and help those in need. Um, and telehealth is one of the great tools that we have to do it. Um, and we can address a variety of issues. It, it doesn't, telehealth doesn't restrict us to only helping certain types of people. Um, it, can make it more difficult for certain things, but we have come up with some amazing and creative ways to get around that. And if that's the way that a person needs to be seen, we will definitely work our best to do that.